Thank you so much. I will go ahead and uh, if you're ready for me to go ahead and get started, I will go ahead and, and get started. Thanks for joining us. Good morning, LA. Uh, I was just talking earlier about how I am in Texas. I'm hot and it's humid and <laughs> I have a nice Texas background for you guys um, today. But if you can live through this, this deep, thick Southern accent for the hour, then I commend you. I know it may be challenging. I, I'll try to tone it down as much as I can. But thanks for joining us today for tips and tools and advocating for your child with disabilities. I will uh, kind of tell you a little bit about myself and uh, my background. So oh, I apologize. Here we go. Let's see if I can get this to move there. All right. So we're going to do a quick welcome. I'm going to be covering advocating and educational settings. Just a few little tips and tools for you about understanding your rights, some resources that are available that may be um, more national resources or kind of out of your typical resources. And that's a great thing. Uh, the more resources, the better. And then we're going to close up with the top five tips for successfully navigating the advocating, because that can be a, a very difficult thing. Um, and, and it can be very exhausting. I'm not going to lie. You know, uh, I was just saying last night, I'm tired. I'm a, I'm a, uh, I have a 25 year old daughter. So I'm going to go ahead and and uh, show you my daughter. This is Riley. She is 25 years old. I have a son who is 23. You will see him in a lot of the pictures. Um, Riley uh, actually got me started in education. I was not, uh, I never intended on being in education. I'm not saying I don't like kids. I do, but I never once considered, hey, I want to teach. But after she was born, I went back to school and uh, got a degree in special education and spent over 20 years in public education here in Texas. Um, I was either at what we, we have service centers here. So that means that in rural Texas, we will break off little regions and have um, centers available for teachers to be trained. And we also would go out and provide support. So I worked at um, one of our service centers in Dallas. And then I also worked at another service center in rural Northeast Texas, uh, which was actually in Mount Pleasant, Texas, which is very, very tiny. And then again, I was a special education teacher for over 12 years. And then I went on to receive my master's in applied behavior analysis and uh, then went on to become a BCBA, a board certified behavior analyst. So behavior has been one of my areas that I have always been um, heavily involved in. Um, personally, uh, again, my daughter is 25. I was a single parent from the time she was about six years old. And so um, I raised her as a single mom, both of my children. And that was its own set of challenges. And then um, we had a few places that we moved that were a little bit more open to, uh, you know, inclusion. But, you know, primarily in my rural area of Sulphur Springs, Texas, there are probably about 12 individuals with Down syndrome in our entire county. Um, and Riley, my daughter, was the first student with Down syndrome to be in an inclusive setting. It was not a large school district. And so um, it was very challenging at times to work with staff. If you think they gave me a free pass because I was an educator, they did not. <laughs> and so it was at times very challenging. So um, I'm very proud of my daughter. She's amazing. She is actually at play practice. We have a community theater in town for all uh, young adults and adults and children. And she participates in plays. Uh, that's one of her favorite things to do. So this year is Chitty Chitty Bang Bang. So I will be doing that. I will have be chitty chitty bang banged out for about the next two months. So, uh, but anyway, this is Riley. As you can see, Riley is a big time model. She really enjoys it. She actually works at a boutique here in town called Thick and Thin, and they uh, sell clothing and gifts. And um, it is a phenomenal job. She loves it. In fact, there are many days when I leave and think I want Riley's job. Um, she has a boyfriend she didn't tell me about, but he uh, came to one of her dances. She talks with him back and forth with Snapchat. So uh, she just got her first tattoo. So she's quite, uh, 
quite independent. Uh, she is looking for an apartment. She wants an apartment. Mom sometimes worries a little bit about some of the logistics. So we're still working on that. And one of the things that I was talking about earlier is that being in a rural community, you know, we don't have Uber. We don't have a lot of services. So we have to get very creative out here in the middle of nowhere, Texas. And so sometimes transition and things are going to look very different uh, than they would in LA. I could only dream of all the resources that you guys probably have, but there are pros and cons. I think we were talking about even um, advocating medically for our um, uh, young adults, children, uh, babies with Down syndrome. And we were just talking earlier about how that looks when you get a brand new baby doctor that has a clean slate that may have been exposed more to um, some of the newer ideas. Uh, but those are just a few of the things that, that we navigate here in our rural area. So I'm gonna start off by talking to you guys a little bit about advocating in educational settings. And a lot of this is going to come from just my experience of, of advocating, but um, in areas where there was no inclusion, you know, uh, many of our children with Down syndrome and other disabilities were immediately, automatically placed in a self-contained special education environment. So through my years of advocating, I've learned some things. And then as my experience as a teacher, because I can kind of see things from multiple different perspectives. So I see it from an educational perspective. I was a teacher in a special education classroom. I loved my students. I worked very hard. I provided them um, with, with everything that I could possibly do to support them. And I also supported them in inclusion. With that being said, there uh, I want to start off by saying one size will never fit all. And that includes inclusion and educational placements. And I, I stick by that. I stick by the fact that there was, um, you know, my daughter spent time in special education classrooms as well as in general education placements. And there were reasons for both of those. And I made those decisions and she made those decisions when she was old enough for very, you know, important reasons. And I, I like to tell the joke that I advocated. I mean, we called OCR. It was a huge big deal at the school that she was at for inclusion purposes. And after about two years after that, after that whole debacle that I went through and all that stress, she sat down in an ARD meeting and said, I want to go to a smaller classroom where I get more help for reading and for math. And I remember thinking, hush, no, you don't. Mom fought for this. Do not. Do but then I had to say, you know what? She is explaining to me that she wants to be in a smaller environment. So I always come back and say, one size will never fit all. I don't want anybody to leave here and say, man, if I don't think that this placement, whether that be an inclusion placement or a special education classroom is going to be the best placement, we have to look at our individual uh, children. And so keep that in mind. One size will never fit all. And our journeys are, are very much like that. One of the things that I always want to point out for educational purposes is remembering the importance of the continuum of educational placements. There is that whole continuum that goes from full inclusion to a self-contained classroom, and you have all of those points in between, whether they be a pull-out system where they're pulled out throughout the day of a general education placement for more intensive interventions and supports, but keep in mind that importance of a continuum. It doesn't have to be all inclusive, you know, an inclusive environment, nor does it have to be all in a special education environment. There is a reason why there is a continuum. And you're going to sit here and we're going to probably be able to all agree that we have seen our own children have splintered skills, what I like to call splintered skills. Riley was a phenomenal reader. She was reading at the age of three. She was a great reader, but there were other things that she struggled with and they, they were big struggles for her. And so we saw sort of that splintered skills where she had great skills in some areas and in other areas, she most certainly needed help. So I could see where that continuum of educational placements, I could lay that over her needs and see how important that was, that there were times where I could uh, know that this is the best placement for her. 
and advocate for that. And then there were other times where I thought, you know what, she may need additional support in this area. And having that in a pullout environment may be the best way to teach her. And so kind of having that, that idea of a continuum of educational placements that meets our individual child. And that is why that IEP is so important. It is an individual you know, educational plan designed just for your child. And so making sure that, that you guys are familiar with that continuum of services that are available at a school and knowing that that can always change as well. And I pay, you know, and I'll bring this up later, nothing is ever permanent. Uh, and I look at that, you know, this is not a permanent placement. These are not permanent services. These are very fluid. They oftentimes change. The other thing that I like to make sure that I touch on briefly when we're talking about advocating in an educational setting is the importance of data. It is so important. It provides you a baseline, like the baseline of this is where my kid is at. This is exactly how they're performing. It also allows you to be able to monitor their progress because I always would come back and say, hey, if we've changed this placement, or we're doing this extra intervention or this accommodation, how is it How is it helping her progress towards her goal? And did we create the correct goals? And data is going to be the thing that will explain and support all of those things. Data becomes very important when you are advocating for your child in any educational placement. And guys, I tell this to teachers. You do not walk into an ARD meeting with a suggestion with your, um, you know, uh, how you're going to approach that parent by saying, hey, I believe that this is the best placement for your child without data. You must have that and it must be accurate. Never ever hesitate to ask for data that's been graphed. Ask for data that is that shows you percentages, not just that 70 magic, 70% or 80%. I want to be able to see if this is at 67% or at 74%, 74.2. I want to be able to look at that because it's going to tell me a wonderful picture. Uh, and so data is extremely important. Oftentimes, I tell teachers this. They feel like if they write everything down, that that's going to be the best, best way to collect data. And that's not really the case. The best way to look at data is with a real graph and being able to look at this and say, I can see a trend. I can see progress here. And that also helps when you are working with outside providers as well as a physician. Let's just say that you have your child that may be on medication for uh, an attention deficit or maybe on medication for other reasons, even medical reasons. This data is going to make sure that you are monitoring all things and you can share that with your physician. If I see a trend where I have students that struggle more with staying awake in the morning or in the afternoon, in fact, I was just in San Antonio, Texas, working with a teacher who said, hey, what behavior advice, you know, Mimi is a behavior person. She said, hey, what's some good behavior advice for one of my students that's constantly sleeping? You know, he's not disrupting class, but it's just really hard to keep him engaged because he seems so tired all the time. And the student walked in. I took one look and said, hey, have we visited with the parent? Have you mentioned? Have you asked if this student may have sleep apnea? Because that's one of the things that, you know, hey, when we're tired, we're not going to be, you know, ready to learn. We're not going to be able to hold our attention. And baseline would data that you could send to a doctor where they could look and say, hey, this student is falling asleep, at, at, you know, from 11 o'clock until one o'clock, they're very tired or anytime they get in a sitting position, we see them falling asleep and they've actually collected data. A doctor would be able to look at that and say, yes, this is a problem. And for those of you who, who do have, you know, children with Down syndrome, you've probably gone through sleep apnea screenings and testing, and you're aware of those questions that they ask, like, do they fall asleep when they're riding in the car? Do they fall asleep when they're sitting still? So this kind of data not only supports creating goals and knowing about, you know, what would be the best placement and how to... Um, you know, do we have really good goals in place with a baseline, but it also helps us with some medical issues as well. 
Now, I, I come back and I want to make sure that I touch on this. Sometimes an outside advocate is worth it. Um, outside advocates, I've dealt with many advocates. I'm actually a trained advocate, and I'm going to share with you where I got my training from. Uh, but I urge you to approach this with the same way you would with anything. You know, um, I make sure that I've met many advocates and I've sat down with many advocates and I realize that sometimes this is their the way they make a living. So they may not be as eager to resolve issues as sometimes I would like them to be, because the reality is, is that this is, you know, this is how they make a living and there's nothing wrong with that. But I want to make sure that the reason why I say sometimes an outside advocate is worth it is because even as a trained advocate, I have brought in advocates on two different occasions. Why? Because I'm talking about my child and I cannot help but get emotional and, you know, feel very passionate about my child. And I may not always articulate everything um, the way that I intended to because it is my child. And so remember, it is okay to seek an outside advocate and bring an outside advocate. I always make sure that, uh, you know, I let the school know in advance that there will be an advocate present. Um, I let them know at the very beginning of um, our meeting that the advocate will be speaking on, on my behalf for this, this, and this. So please address the advocate as well as myself. But um, that is just something that I want to make sure that no matter how much we know, I, I've sat across the table from parents as an educator, and uh, I've sat across from other advocates. So me being an advocate, there were times where I thought it doesn't matter. I still want someone who is, can rationally look at this and may not get as emotional as I would get sometimes with my own child. And so the last tip that I can give you for advocating in an educational setting is making sure that you pay very close attention to the supports and the prompting that your child is getting and if they have planned to fade those supports. I will say this, and I've said this a hundred times before, and I think we were just talking earlier uh, when I was, you know, visiting before everyone joined us, um, that oftentimes some of the biggest obstacles that our children face are not always that learning difference that they, you know, may need additional support and modified content, but oftentimes it is challenging behaviors that will prevent our children from being successful in a variety of, of environments. And oftentimes that closes many doors for us. Behavior and communication are two of the most important things. And so making sure that we pay very close attention to supports and prompting that's been offered to our child, that there is a plan in place to fade those. Because one thing that we do know is that we may have these great supports that, that, that are in place in our educational setting. And then when our child turns 22 and 23 and they no longer have those supports in place, we often find children who um, are very much prompt dependent. And they are much very much dependent on someone, what I like to call, um, you know, running interference for them. They have someone there that can translate for them, that can say, hey, I think what they're trying to tell you is this. And that may be great, but a really good educational goal will make sure and have fading in place because we want to create independence because independence makes our children happy. It makes them independent when we are not around and able to provide them the supports that they need. And again, one of the most important things is being independent will create happiness for your child. I don't want our students to ever become so dependent on the supports and the prompting that it stifles their ability. And sometimes that's there. I was a very big advocate uh, to steer away from one-on-one -on -one support for any child that um, my own child or any child that I taught. And there was a reason for that. When we're talking about safety reasons, absolutely. I would be like, hey, this is a safety reason. We're going to need a one-on-one -on -one para to, to help, you know, create a, a safe environment uh, for this child. But at the same time, I want to see how I'm going to fade that one-on-one. -on -one. And there's a reason for that. 
because, and I say this, I don't know, you know, I almost want to poll you guys and say, you know, how many of you are working with very, you know, how many of you have very young children with Down syndrome? Um, because what happens is the para begins to impede uh, the opportunity for the peers to create relationships and friendships. They oftentimes prevent natural things from occurring, natural learning experiences in the environment, which are very important for our kids. Again, when we're talking about safety, I never hesitate. Absolutely. I can see where we would need one-on-one -on -one support, but I always want to make sure that you pay very close attention when we are asking for those supports, prompting, and um, accommodations. Do we have things in place to fade those and to generalize those? In other words, um, how many of you remember, of course, I'm going to pull, you can raise your hand or drop it in the chat if you want to. How many of you remember um, we used to have calming rooms or snoozle rooms is what we used to call them. And they were amazing. I wanted to lay in there all day as a teacher. I just wanted to go to that room and stay there. There was an aquarium and it was a nice comfy beanbag. And I was like, this is great. But then at the same time, I can remember sitting down with a parent and it was another parent that told me this. And they're like, that's great, Miss Reed. I'm glad you have this room. But what do I do when I'm at Walmart? You know, what do I do when I'm at the store and there's no snoozle room? And I thought, oh, that's an excellent point when you need to grocery shop. How are you going to do this? There is no place to retreat to go for a calming place. So what am I teaching your child? And what am I helping to facilitate that you can generalize that's not just going to be successful in this classroom or on this campus, but how is this going to be successful anywhere you go? That's what a good intervention is. A good intervention is going to be successful anywhere that you go. A good intervention is going to plan for fading that support and those prompting so that that way we are creating and facilitating independence with our kids. So those are just the top five tips for education settings for advocating. Um, I know we only have an hour, so I'm going to make sure that I don't get too far into it and, and allow you times for questions when we finish. But again, if I could say top five things that I would tell you for advocating in educational settings, this would be it. And sometimes we forget about that fading of supports. All right. So understanding your rights. You are the expert on your child. And we've heard this. It's almost come to the point where I'm like, yeah, I know I'm the expert on my child. But I'm going to add a little bit by saying this. I was an expert with my child, but man, when I went through ABA, uh, you know, graduate school, I came back and said, whoops, I did that wrong. <laughs> I probably could have done that differently. So I say this, take your expertise on your child and overlay them with the expertise of the professionals. And that includes educators. They went to school to do this. That includes occupational therapists speech therapist, uh, physical therapist, behavioral therapist, all of these people, this is their area of expertise and never ever hesitate to ask. I can remember sitting down with not just, you know, educators and not just therapists, but sitting down with, with dentists and with doctors and saying, tell me a little bit about what you know about Down syndrome. Tell me a little bit about your experience in working with individuals or children or toddlers or teenagers or adults with Down syndrome, because I want to look at where you're an expert. You're an expert in speech therapy. That's amazing. I didn't go to school for that. I've read some books and I know my kid. I can look at my kid and tell you, hey, I've been with this kid now for 20 something years. That's probably not going to work. But I also know that I'm going to listen to your expertise. And I'm also going to pay close attention to your experience. Again, I ask those questions. Is it bad if someone has no experience in working with individuals with Down syndrome? No, that's not bad. Sometimes that's great because sometimes they're a clean slate. And, uh, but here's one thing I can tell you as a parent, you set the tone. You set the tone for how you want these outside professionals to interact with your child. I have very, I have always had very high expectations. Again, when I went through uh, graduate school in behavior analysis, I was like, mm, 
I did that wrong. I know I was the parent and I was doing my best, but I could have done that better. I could have done it differently. But I always set the tone by saying, I expect Riley to do this. I expect us to meet this goal. I expect her to do this. And when they saw me have those expectations, then I transferred that to them and said, watch me. If I am the expert in my child, watch me. Watch me be able to set the expectation in place. And I also wanted them to watch me so that they could say, hey, that's perfect, except for let's try this one little extra thing when you're prompting her for speech, when you're working with articulation. Let's try this. That seems to help. And I still go back to those experts and remember the things that they taught me. I just told my daughter the other day, she was in a hurry. She was telling me something. I was trying to curl her hair. She was getting ready to go do a play performance. And I said, Riley, you're going to have to turtle talk me through this. And that came from a speech therapist back when she was in second grade that taught Riley to turtle talk. She can't get so excited because then her articulation goes out the window and we lose intelligibility. And I use that same prompt from that speech therapist. She was a professional. She was an excellent speech therapist. Now, I knew my daughter and I felt like I knew what she needed, but I used her expertise to build on that. And we worked together as a partner. One thing that I will tell you again is IDEA was designed to be litigated. Now, I'm going to repeat that. IDEA was designed to be litigated. In order for it to go into, to, to be put into place, they had to make it very vague, right? I mean, we can understand how things don't get passed unless sometimes they're very ba vague and they can, you know, get through quick, you know, um, the legality part of it. So I always come back and say, hey, IDEA was designed to be litigated. Every year we have more litigation that comes forward based off of IDEA and that's okay. And that's what it was meant to do. Now, as a parent, I can tell you that it's sometimes better to attempt to meet that district halfway, to work with them, to try your best to avoid litigation. And there are multiple reasons why. One, it's faster. Y'all, this stuff drags out for forever. When you get into due process, when you call OCR, sometimes those things take a very long time. And to be honest, I felt like there were times that I, I, I didn't have that much time to spare. And I thought, you know what, I'm going to sit down and we're going to come to a, you know, to uh, an agreement to where they hear me and I hear them and we try to have some sort of a compromise. The other one is it's cheaper. I don't know about you, but I had to pay for my, you know, advocates that would come and, and, and help me at ARD meetings. And it's tolerable. And I say that because, guys, I don't know how many nights of sleep I lost just worried so much about things that were going on at school or that had to do with, you know, ensuring that she was in inclusion and all of those things and all these pending ARD meetings where I would sit down. Even as an educator, I would sit in a room and feel so drained and so tired and so stressed. And, and I was a single parent and maybe that had something to do with it. But I found it to where I worked with a wonderful advocate one time. And when he showed up with donuts, I was like, why are you feeding these people donuts? They've been terrible to me. And he was like, hey, I'm coming in with the attitude is that we're all going to find a, a compromise here today. You're going to get what you want and what you need. And we're going to hear them out and we're going to work with them. And one of the other things that I can ask you is I never hesitate to ask teachers in ARD meetings. How much training have you had on modifying content? How much training have you had on behavior uh, data collection? How much training have you had? I asked those questions. Did you take a class on that? I know what your coursework looked like in college. Did you take a class on that? One of the things I didn't tell you, and, and I will go back to that, is my son is actually a first year alt cert. That's an alternative certified special education teacher. And I said, son, I did this for 20 years. What, do you see how old I am and how tired I am? Why did you do this? And he was like, hey, mom, I can do it. I'm going to do this until I get into medical school. It's going to be fine. He called me every day in tears. I'm losing my mind. This is so hard. He was trying to be the perfect teacher. And guess what? Teachers sometimes don't have the training. 
They didn't have the coursework. They don't have the ongoing professional development. And sometimes they just don't have the knowledge. And oftentimes they're short staffed. Uh, they may be dealing with a lot of things. Is that your fault as a parent? Absolutely not. But I extend what I like to call a little bit of grace and mercy and say, hey, have you had some training in this? If not, I know there's great courses available. I know there's online training that's free and available. Hey, there's a great training through the college, the Florida Institute of Technology. They offer free training for professionals. Have you thought about signing up for that? So I never hesitate to say, hey, I could litigate this. We could go further into this. But right now, I want to be able to, to pick through and see, could I get you connected with resources as a professional? I was trained through rights law. I'm sure some of you are very familiar with rights law. Rights law is a great group. Um, I was trained by them in Oklahoma. I actually drove to Oklahoma to receive that training. They train parents. Um, and so if you are ever thinking to yourself, I want advocacy training that is effective and uh, thorough and well-regarded, Rights Law offers that to you. And you can simply Google that and it's available. You do have to pay for the training, but it is well worth it. You receive five or six books that, of course, you know, everything becomes dated after a while. So you have to make sure that you get any updated uh, changes in federal law, but it is a fantastic training. Finding local advocacy groups and parent groups. Many times I will have parents reach out to me and say, hey, you don't know me, but someone gave me your name. Can you help me? I have a question. This has happened at school. So for those of us who have been through this, for years, if you have a brand new three-year-old, four-year-old, five-year-old, and you're navigating, or a 13-year-old, and you're navigating education or any time that you're having to advocate, just remember that your parent groups are great groups. You have parents that have experience with this. They are also going to tell you, I was the first person that said, uh-uh-uh, you know, that, I know that's there, but that might not work out for you. It didn't work out for me. So you may want to tread cautiously there. How about you try this group as well? So that's the, the strength of a good parent group. The other thing that kind of goes back to the tolerable is I had to learn that there were big deals and little deals. And I use this with my own children. I use this in the classroom. I had to make sure that there were sometimes if it was a little deal, I had to let it go. Because if a big deal came along, I needed the strength, I needed the uh, sanity, and I needed to make sure that I was taken seriously when a big deal came about. So I, I want to make sure that your big deals and my big deals and little deals are going to be completely different, right? But I had to say, hey, you know what? If they didn't send this home, if they didn't grade this the right way, if they sent home a worksheet that I really don't necessarily agree with, I'm going to go ahead and make a note and send it back to him and say, hey, this was a difficult thing for us. Do you think that there's any way that you could fix this? And I saved a lot of my strength for when big deals came up, for when I got a notice saying, hey, we want to change your child's placement. That was a big deal. And that was when I had to get ready. I had to have all my guns ready. I had to be completely ready, get all psyched up. I mean, I had to be prepared for that. And so I always come back and say, if I can keep it a little deal and I get a good response from them and I respond with it in a little way and just give them a reminder, I'm going to do it. So that that way, when a big deal comes along, I'm ready for it. Because if you're not tired yet, you're going to get tired. It's life. We're going to get tired. You know, again, my daughter's 25 years old. And just yesterday, I was like, I'm tired of having to drive her places. We don't have Uber here. We don't have public transportation. So that means baseball, theater practice, friends' houses for parties, everything. Mom drives her. And we happen to live out in the country. So it's 15 to 20 minutes one way and 15 to 20 minutes back. And I'm so tired. And there are times where I'm like, you know what? I have to still remind myself, is this a big deal or a little deal? Is it a big deal that the doctor said something, you know, that was incorrect when I was at the doctor's office because they're not as familiar with Down syndrome as I would like them to be? That's a little deal. I offered them a correction and moved on and, and dealt with it. 
So I had to learn how to process big deals. There's going to be big deals for a very long time. And there's going to be a lot of little deals. So I tried to figure out a good way to balance that. Now, when we think about resources, I know that you have your local parent groups. There are social media groups. In fact, I was just telling her earlier, there's a phenomenal group and it is called Adults with Down Syndrome Group. Uh, they, they have um, a Facebook page. They also have, you know, a, um, a web page. They're amazing. They cover medical issues, changes in behavior. Uh, they even have menopause visuals for uh, adults with females with Down syndrome that are going through menopause. So, I mean, man, they have so many resources. So you can find those things on social media between other parents. But I also encourage you to reach out to other professionals and providers. If you get information from one speech therapist, never hesitate to say, you know what? I want a second opinion. It's someone who's outside of the school. I want to see what they have to say. That's an independent evaluation or an independent opinion. And that's perfectly fine. Just like you would do the same thing when you get a medical response where you're like, I don't know about that. I think I want a, a second opinion on that. OCR, the Office of Civil Rights, they are phenomenal. Um, I skipped over my state education agency, which here in Texas is called the Texas Education Agency. I skipped right on over them because after years of working with them, I was like, I'm not doing that. I'm going straight to OCR. And I did. I went straight to OCR with one of my big deals that came up and they were phenomenal in the way they responded. So never hesitate to reach out to OCR. You also have your state education agency. It may be better there in California <laughs> than ours is here in Texas. I'm not sure. And then you have also the Office of Special Education Programming, OSIP is what we like to call it. They have great resources available as well. You can actually call them and say, hey, I have a question about best practice in a special education classroom. And they're going to give you the resources and feedback and support uh, and connect you uh, with individuals who will even reach out sometimes to the school district. The other thing is you may have to reach out to advocates and attorneys. And again, that's okay. I would encourage you to make sure that you know that they, if they are part of the group that is a coalition of parents and um, advocates and attorneys, uh, that would be where I would tell you to first make sure that they are a part of that group. And again, rights law is also available. They're parents, they do trainings, and they do them all over the United States. Now, when we're talking about navigating uh, the advocating, I will end with this. Always keep the start to finish in mind. I used to, as grim as it sounds, I used to say, hey, cradle to the grave is how I'm thinking. I'm thinking about Riley when I was thinking, and really, guys, we do this for all of our kids, don't we? I mean, we're always raising our kids to become healthy, happy adults. That's our goal. That's what we want. And we start, that's what parenting is. We're starting when they're little and we're saying, hey, I'm doing my very best to prepare them for when I'm not here. And so I always say, keep that in mind when you consider things like one-on-one -on -one paras and prompting and supports that are available and advocating, self-advocating teaching them how to advocate for their self. That's you thinking about the finish in mind. That's you thinking about what's going to happen when mom isn't here. You know, what's going to happen when, when the parent or the guardian is not here to run that interference. And also be prepared for when your child has a voice, when they are able to tell you that they're not happy in a placement. And again, that happened to me after I'd fought so hard for inclusion, my own kid, told me at the table in front of everyone, I want to go to a special education classroom for this portion of the day. And I wanted to cry. I tried so hard and advocated so much. And she said, it will make me happy. This will make me happy. This is what I need. And, you know, I even told her, are you sure this is what you need? Don't you want to think about it? And she was like, no. And now looking back on it, guys, I see my daughter with friends and both you know, she has friends without disabilities and, and her best friend and her boyfriend have disabilities. She, it was a perfect thing for her growing up as where she was able to experience the best of both worlds. She was involved in things that were designed for other individuals with disabilities. And then she was also very much involved in general education and in her community. 
And so I think that turned out to be great for Riley. It may not be great for everyone, but it worked out for her. But she did have a voice and she did tell me what she wanted. And I had to listen to that because I'm an advocate for her. And then she was advocating for herself, which was great. You're going to get tired eventually. Plan for that. Again, I was a single parent. I had no family around. So I was exceptionally tired. But I feel like that we are best at advocating when we are able to get a little breather for ourselves, be able to take care of ourselves a little bit. That allows us to be able to say, hey, are these big deals or little deals? I'm going to pace myself. I'm going to make sure that I realize that nothing is permanent, not these placements, not this therapy, not these supports, not these needs. And now remember, life skills are very important for all of our kids, Down syndrome or not. So whenever I hear someone say, well, I don't want them to be teaching my child life skills. Hey, life skills are super important. That doesn't mean that I want my entire day or my daughter's entire day when she was in school to be filled with life skills instruction. But life skills are important. Knowing how to do certain things within her community and within, you know, when, when adulthood came around was very important. And I appreciated that, that opportunity to have some life skills. In fact, when my son was trying to do his taxes this year, I said, you needed a class in this child. And I kept saying, why didn't we have a class in Texas for this? So just keep in mind that life skills are not always bad. Life skills are important. So having the opportunity for that instruction, it may be at school, it may be outside of school, but they're always important because again, they're going to help create independence for our kids. And I will go back and say again, nothing is permanent. It will not be permanent, not placements, not therapies, not supports, not needs. Even our minds will change about things. Um, I can remember when guardianship came up. I got guardianship and I knew there were alternatives to guardianship. I was educated on that, but I had my own reasons for doing that. That was specifically for my family that I had to take into account, you know, with being a single mom and a contentious divorce. I mean, I had to consider that. So again, I don't disagree with people who choose not to do guardianship, but I never pass any judgment by saying, Hey, and guess what? That's not permanent. It doesn't have to be permanent. And so I don't want us to think that when we make decisions or make mistakes or placements are made or things are done, that that's set in stone because it's not. This is fluid. Everything is fluid. So if your child needs additional support in one area, that's fluid. Get those things in place and and, and create you know a, a plan to fade those supports and move that child closer to independence and closer to full inclusion if that's your goal. So just realize that nothing is permanent and it doesn't have to be and it won't be. All right. I actually have a Facebook page where I post a lot of stuff for parents that is going to include, you know, uh, adults, kids, uh, special education, not just for Down syndrome, but I have a lot of them, a lot of different uh, supports that I will place up there uh, for special educator teachers, as well as parents. Uh, You can find me by searching for Angela Reed, Special Education Consultant. Uh, Again, it is a Facebook page. I've also included uh, my email address. Bear with me. I travel a lot this time of year with my regular job. And so I don't always have the opportunity to get back with people immediately. But um, it is Angela K. Reed at me.com. Just feel free to reach out to me with any questions that you may have. And then we have time for any questions. So if you have any questions that you would like to ask, hopefully I've reserved about 10 minutes here at the end to be able to, to answer any of those Thank you so much. You are so welcome. <clears throat> um, uh, somebody said uh, in uh, in our um, what is it our uh, chat chat. Uh, yeah, <laughs> you get the definition and examples of what an advocate is, and I don't know if that's why we already covered. Oh, okay. That question. So <laughs> yeah, sure. So an advocate is going to be someone, a special education advocate is going to be someone that is going to speak on your behalf. They are often, and you want to make sure that they are individuals who are familiar with the educational system. They are familiar with your child's disability and they are familiar with the legal framework. So they understand the law, the federal law, which is IDEA, which is the Individuals with Disabilities Educational Act. So we want to make sure that they're familiar with federal law 
and they can sit down on your behalf and say, Hey, hold up. We didn't follow the, the law with this. You know, we, we said that we were going to change this child's placement and we didn't have data to support that. We didn't um, discuss with the parent. We didn't have an ARD meeting for the parent to be able to, to voice that. And so that is uh, having an advocate. You can find them on that COPA website. You simply enter your zip code and they will find the closest advocate for you. Again, most advocates have a charge just like attorneys do, but they are typically not as expensive as an attorney. Uh, and I'm sure that your center there, uh, there in LA may have a list of advocates. Parents may say, I have a wonderful advocate here in Texas, and I don't know about California, but there is one advocate here in Texas that's known Texas wide, and he does phenomenal things. And when he walks into a school district, they respect him. They know that he is not uh, going to go crazy out of, I mean, he's very fair He's very thorough and he is extremely knowledgeable of federal education law. And so when he walks in the door, they tend to say, oh, hey, David Binky is here and he calls himself the special ed Marine. And they they are on their P's and Q's. And you know what? I remember sitting across from many advocates and I learned things as, a, as an educator. I would say, oh, I never thought of that. You know, that was a great idea. I didn't view it as a threat when an advocate showed up because all they're doing is advocating for your child on your behalf with the knowledge that they have of the education system. Before, I know a lot of people are signing off, but I wanted to share this uh, flyer for next month. Uh huh. If uh, let me just put it on screen right now, and then you guys. Um, so uh, you can go to our website and sign up for our next uh, month's uh, workshop. Uh, appreciate it. And um, sorry, let me go back to stop sharing. Uh, and I also wanted to share that there's a program here in in, in Los Angeles called the Tiger Program. The Tiger it's something tiger but I'll, mm -hmm. i have it online here they um <clears throat> they train parents uh to advocate for your child oh, that's nice. so they do a lot of you know like services um they do um uh i you know for ieps and just that's amazing and so uh, let me see if i can share that page with you guys uh, so uh, I just think that it's uh, a lot of our parents have gone through that training. Yes. Yeah. That is so yeah. wonderful. How nice is that? And then once you register, you do have to show up. So it's so many sessions, mm -hmm. so many sessions. And then um, I'll share that in the, in the, in the chat. That's great. That is amazing. You know, I had to pay girl. I had to pay a lot of money and drive all the way to Oklahoma from <laughs> Texas. So I was like, this is crazy, but uh, we didn't have that. But how wonderful is that? And you know what? I always tell people, I used to joke around and say, I wanted to be the person that gave sex education to my kids. I didn't want mm -hmm. them to learn it on the bus because I was the person that I felt like could explain it the way they needed to hear it. And I keep telling school districts, Hey, don't you want to be the people that explain the rights to the parents mm -hmm. as edu you know, as educators and as school districts, I would encourage them to do trainings for parents. Educate your parents on the special education process, their rights. You are the person that knows so much, share it with them. But you guys have a program for parents that is phenomenal. Mm -hmm. What a blessing that is. That is so huge. How yeah. great. And they that give you wonderful. a certificate at the end of the yeah. It's like that is wonderful. Six to maybe six to 10 trainings. Um, so, yeah. So yeah. yeah, it's a, it's a long training. I remember. Yeah. Even when I drove to Oklahoma, it was about four days. It was long training for four yeah, days. Yeah, but yeah, yeah. It was good. It was well worth it. Well worth it. Thank you. And uh, w one of the things that I know you touched up on this, like, um, you know, with data and stuff like that. Um, I just like, if you're in special education advocating for your child and uh they're denying i don't know usually speech or behavior yep. therapy or whatever it is uh I, you know the first thing to know is that you have to challenge the the, the assessment you know yep, yep. oh absolutely you you know because yeah. 
a lot of times, uh, most of the calls that we get is like, oh, I, you know, they're, they don't want to give my child um, speech therapy because that's one of the yeah. biggest things. Mm -hmm. And then uh, <clears throat> we have, so, and I'm like, okay, yeah, so I just, you know, he needs speech because of, the, you know, okay, so you need to challenge the assessment. Yes. And, and look at data. And, and what, that's why that data to me was so important. Sometimes with assessments, and assessments, I challenge those as well. I've done that before. I've been in that ex with that exact same question. But I always look at by looking at what we call indirect assessments mm -hmm. and the data that they collect day to day. I want to be able to see a picture of like how often is my child, you know, being able to communicate their wants and needs effectively where some, you know, and, and think about it when they were like, oh, well, they don't need this. Well, it, let's just say how often are you able to you know, I would want data. I would ask for data right. and right. I would ask for them to collect the data so that I could look at it. Because then again, I could take that data to a physician or to another speech therapist and be, you know, just like you said, even the assessment to another outside independent evaluator and say, look at this and tell me, what does this show you? How would you interpret this data? Right. What right. would you see? That is so important. And sometimes schools will breeze over that because it's hard to collect data when you're a teacher. I'm not going to lie. I've been that teacher and, you know, it gets hard, but it is critical in order to make sure that you're creating those goals and everything that you need right. correctly and advocating. Yeah. So, and uh, also the other thing, when you get a, a, I know I remember having such an issue with um, getting a, a communication device for my son mm -hmm. and, and uh, the assessment uh, so I don't know why I, I came up with an idea to to see what tools they use to assess my son. Yes. So mm -hmm. then I went through like the, the assessment and I saw, OK, this is the tool they use to assess my child. On, I don't remember what area. Mm -hmm. But then when I looked up that um, that tool they used, it was used mostly for kids for kids with uh, cerebral palsy. Yes. You know, with more physical needs. And I'm like, so why is this relevant to my child who has Down yep. syndrome? He's very mobile. So, yeah, you know, so then as then it was, you know, once you start realizing how bad their assessments are. Yes, <laughs> girl, know? listen, and I'm going to tell you right now is that when I did behavior assessments, I always attach the tools that I use. I attach the full blown assessment. Um, when I was, you know, uh, preparing to do a behavior intervention plan, they saw both my indirect assessment and my direct assessment. My direct assessment was literally me one-on-one -on -one with that kid. Every question I asked, every response I got, every bit of data collection, observing that child in a so many different environments on so many different days, I made sure that that parent saw the assessment. And then I would say, this is best practice. Best practice is to use direct and indirect assessments. And so when we look at a direct FBA, when you think about behavior is where it gets really tricky in public schools, because there's not necessarily one or two assessments that they constantly go by. They usually do an FBA, which is a functional mm -hmm. behavior assessment, mm -hmm. but everybody's functional behavior assessment may look different. And so I always included my assessment in there with every tool and the other thing was I would attach the evidence-based practices, the interventions I was recommending, all the evidence attached to that. So the parent got that whole packet. And sometimes they were like, lady, you just handed me 300 pages. And I would say, but my goal is, is for you to know that everything I wrote in here for this intervention plan is backed by evidence. And when I look at all the data that I collected, and I analyzed that data, this is how I found and connected all these interventions and why mm -hmm. I chose these interventions. And I really pieced them through that so that they would say, hey, this lady just isn't typing things down or making things up. She's really looking at evidence-based practices. So looking at those assessments, like you said, is important, you know, and being able to pick through that um, and being able to ask those questions and say, and it takes time. It's in you, and you know, this it's hard. Mm -hmm. It's hard to be able to, to look through that and look at all those, uh, you know, different assessments that are used. And, and when they go to a different school, guess what? There'll be a whole new assessment 
and a whole new, you know, and you found, I found myself saying, man, can y'all just not do the same thing from, you know, just instead of me having to reinvent it every time. So I totally get it. That's an excellent point. Excellent. And uh, don't be afraid to use lawyers. Um, There's a lot of local lawyers that uh, use, um, that you can do a pro bono type thing. And when you win your case, um, uh, the district, the school district will um, pay for for whatever expenses you've had. Um, Mm -hmm. But do you have, do you guys have any questions before we go? Because I know it's- I'll go ahead and put my email in the chat as well so that you guys will have it. When you're advocating uh, with the regional center system here in, in, in California, um, always if you uh, are denied any service, just get, get the notice of action. And uh, if you have to go to due process, uh, the court is very friendly towards parents when you're dealing with regional center uh, services. Do y'all have uh, educational service centers there? like? Or is so, that a little bit different? Yeah, it's a little bit different. This, they, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, it's a little bit different. But um, but with the school district, yeah, then you will have to, I don't know, you know. Uh, yeah. You're lucky to get uh, um, your fees paid for by uh, whoever loses. That's amazing. You know? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> you know? yeah. Or well, usually, right. you know, they do uh, cover, the, you know, for the, the child. Uh, the, yes, yeah. The, but, um, and hey, IDEA was meant to be litigated. Yeah, I mean, yeah, it was yeah. so broad that we had to litigate. You know, we have to litigate. So I never tell parents, hey, it's not the end of the world. This is something that probably hasn't come up yet. And it's great to be able to say, hey, this might not have been an issue before, but it is now. And so now we're going to make changes for not just my child, but all the ch- the children in the future. Yeah. And, you know, one of the, I just want to say the last thing, um, and what Angela said that uh, not everything is permanent. Um, take that to heart because when I was going through this with my child when he was in school, uh, I was always so nervous and I was a nerve wrack. I would even get sick, like oh, I have an eye. Yes. Mm-hmm. And uh, you know, had I somebody, I guess somebody, had I known that uh, Angela. Mm-hmm. I know, girl. I know. I know. <laughs> Because I, know. I realized, oh, I can ask for another IP, but I'm not, you know. But yeah, I'm gonna ask yeah, another so, ARD meeting. So yeah, that way you don't get you don't you know get sick from the stress. And yeah, because they're gonna come back and say we've made this change, and it, you're just heartbroken, and you're just thinking, oh my gosh. And I would always say, hey, I had to tell myself this isn't permanent. You know, nothing is permanent. You know, I can withdraw if I wanted to. I could withdraw my kid from special education services, period. I mean, you know, nothing is permanent. Um, so just keep that in mind that you're you're exactly right. I would feel sick to my stomach. And I did this for a living and just feel yeah. horrible so much on, you know, worrying about. And then I had to say, hey, this isn't the way it's always going to be. It is going to change. And every year it felt like it changed. And so did my ideas. They changed almost every couple of years where I would say, I used to think that this was the worst thing that could happen, but no, surprise, it's not. <laughs> Something yeah. else happened. So right. I, had to, sure. I had to learn. Yeah, <laughs> I had to learn. So, well, well I appreciate you. you guys so much. And if you need anything at all, reach out to me. Um, Again, I know this was a very quick overview, but I hope it was just enough to to where if you want to dive deeper into just advocating for education or just assessments or just anything else, I would be more than happy to help. Thank you so much, Angela. Thank you. Thank for you, guys. I hope you have a wonderful, class. sunny day in L.A. <laughs> thank you. And thank, uh, thank you. you, everyone, for spending your morning. And I wish for everybody to have a wonderful weekend or at least the rest of your weekend. <laughs> yep. Enjoy. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank thank you. you. Goodbye. Thanks. Bye.